Okay, welcome to the session. It's a polyglot world. And I'm going to be talking about distributed application runtime. Um, and really what this is all about is that you know, we want to bring the love and ease of distributed systems development to all types of developers, whether you're coming from a favorite language or a favorite framework. And what we see today is that you know, developers struggle to build these apps. You know, we see people who have to take existing code that they built, like they built it somewhere on J2E framework, and they're trying to take that to the cloud or they may have some existing um, uh, on-premise application that are trying to take to the cloud. And you know the last thing they can do is start to throw a lot of that code away. They want to incrementally move that to take it to the cloud. Um, even when you're in the cloud and you're building it with different frameworks, you know, we see that some frameworks have particular limitations. You know, wouldn't it be lovely if I could do publish and subscribe between my two Azure Functions apps, which I can't today, and you have to sort of depend upon you know that particular framework to build those features in there? Or wouldn't it be lovely inside my Node application that I could have long-running, stateful, fully persistent services uh, without me having to do the hard work of hooking up a back-end store? And then finally, we see a lot of this where people kind of target particular uh, run uh, runtimes and platforms you know it's only bound to the cloud it's only bound to the edge it only runs on kubernetes it only runs on swarm it only runs on service fabric so we want to break down all these barriers and effectively enable people to build distributed apps wherever they come from and so that's the goals of dapper uh, or the distributed application runtime um, this is you know the website we have and it talks about dapper as being an event-driven portable runtime for building applications on cloud and edge. And we launched this back in October. Uh, we had a number of press articles. We wrote a great blog post about this. You can go and refer to some of those. And since then, the community has been growing pretty rapidly, and we've been having a, a lot of community engagement. In fact, when we first launched, we only had a, a few components inside there and a few of the building blocks I'm about to talk about. And now we have over 100, nearly 130 external contributors um, in the few six months that we've been there. I'm not going to kind of be able to cover everything inside Dapper, but if you want to go off and learn a little bit more about it yourself, uh, Mr. Mark Rizonovic did a great talk back at Ignite that I'm going to check out. I, I did a bit of a live session earlier this year, um, and we've had MVPs do some great sessions on this. Um, and in fact, I noticed that even in Azure, you've got some other sessions on Dapper, which is fabulous. And uh, of course, dive in to the repo. Go to github.com slash dapper. Go to the Getting Started Guide. And I'm going to give you a little intro to what this is like today to give you a taster of it all. But you can go through many samples there of getting going. So the goals were that we wanted to build and bring best practices building blocks rather than you going off to the Azure Developers Architecture Center and reading all about building distributed apps. It's like, how do you just codify that up and give me something that I can get productive with? And you know, I don't want to come at it from the language and the framework that I'm using. I'm an ASP.NET developer. I'm a Python developer. I'm a Rust developer. You know, I don't want to have to go off and relearn your language to get some of these best practices. Um, the community drives the project. Everything's built inside the open. We adopt standards. Standards things like uh, cloud events, uh, open telemetry um, for diagnostics, um, and we build open and consistent APIs so that you know this is available from all platforms. Uh, being deployed across cloud and edge. And importantly, and I'll show you this, uh, Dapper is a very pluggable, extensible platform. So you can come along and plug in what we call components to take advantage of all the capabilities. Let's dive in a bit more. At its heart, uh, Dapper has this concept of a building block. And a building block is an API that gives you some capabilities. For example, you can call from one service to another service through service invocation. Um, and that will do the discovery of where the service is. It'll find out where it is, and it'll do all hard problems like uh, retries and circuit breaking, and uh, as well as discovery of the service. So these building blocks are exposed over HTTP or gRPC APIs, um, and what that. And on top of that, you can uh, call them in from the language of your choice. And how do you do that? Well, at its simplest level, it's like a REST API. Uh, you can call on to a local host endpoint. Um, in this particular case, you can call on the state, um, the state building block here to call the inventory server, um, the inventory store that I want to call. I want to uh, retrieve a particular piece of state under the key order key. So the state management building block gives you straightforward key value access that you can use, for example, in your shopping cart or your gaming session or uh, the workflow state that you're saving. Um, or I can invoke over another simple API another method. I can, for example, I can evoke the new order method of my app 
you know, somewhere wherever my app is running. And the way Dapper achieves this is it's by it has a local sidecar library. You know, this gets dynamically roaded as part of your app, and an instance gets created for each one of your applications um, that spins up. So this is what it looks like. Um, effectively, you spin up your code, your service A and your service B, all part of your larger application. And each instance of your app, uh, service spins up a little Dapper sidecar. These are very lightweight, they're less than 40 megabytes in size. We're fanatical on perf. Uh, you'll see later this month, we're going to be perf publishing perf and scale numbers. And then because of that, you get all these benefits that Dapper provides you. Um, for example, you know, through these Dapper APIs, you can save state into a variety of different state stores. Um, when we first launched, we only had Cosmos DB and Redis, and the community added DynamoDB, Cassandra, Firebase, Mongo, um, and a, a number of other ones. Uh, you can take advantage of publishing and subscribing messages between your services through a publish and subscribe mechanism. Um, that can include NAT server, RabbitMQ, Service Bus, Event Grid, um, Redis, and a, and a whole bunch of others you can plug into. Um, or you can take events from external systems. You can be trigger your code inside here from a message that comes in via Twilio or a Kafka queue. And then best of all, all this communication between your services is entirely secured over uh, MTLS, so you have secure communication. And then we track all these calls that happen you know, through both the pub subsystem and the calls between your services and give you deep observability. And I'll show you what that looks like. So I can see call graphs, I can see metrics, I can see logs. So Dapper provides you sort of all these benefits and releasing you to be able to write your code. Um, the good thing about this, this platform that Dapper has will run on anything, any different types of infrastructure. Um, I'll show you lots of things that you can run just on your local machine. Um, and we've implemented deeply with Kubernetes, so you can run that, and other platforms such as you know, running it on Service Fabric and Docker Swarm and um, Cloud Foundry, all of those can come in time. Um, and because we kind of have a you know the ability to deploy to just simple VMs or to sort of Kubernetes environments, you can run across other clouds pretty easily as well. So let's kind of dive into what these building blocks are, and I'll show you some demos. Um, these are the seven that we're sort of starting off with. And you know, these cover from calling between services for service indication, call it saving state for state management, um, doing pub sub between your services, triggering from external events, actor like frameworks for um, encapsulating code and state, and then observability for seeing your diagnostics. And finally, and I think one of the most exciting that got added by the community was secrets management. Uh, we came across many people who just wanted to be able to retrieve a secret very easily. Now you can do that over a simple API. Um, let me show you a kind of a couple of um, PowerPoint slide samples, and then we'll go and see what one, what one looks like. Uh, so service invocation. Here I am, front end app. I want to call my back end cart application to save some um, to call to get the data from my cart, and I can just say call invoke the checkout method, and Dapper will route the call correctly to wherever the cart instance is running, and you can do that, um, and then response comes back as well. Um, so this is a kind of a, a two-way call that I may be able to do. Or equally, I want to be able to save some data. My app can post a local endpoint here over to state with the store name I want. Here's the key value data I want. And then this gets stored as key value data in the database of my choice or the store of my choice. Um, you can make this, I uh, don't have a chance to dive into this quite too much, but you can make this uh, transactional data stores. Um, so you can do you know, multiple state transactions if you want, and you can do various different types of concurrency models on top of it all. And then by calling a get method on here for the actual name of the key here, for example, the key here is planet key, I can retrieve back you know, the data that I store inside here. So let's go and see a little demo of this in action because you know that helps solidify it all. Um, here's one of our um, applications that we have. That's if you go off to our repo, if you go to um, dapper, uh, github.dapper and samples, you'll find that there's a hello world sample inside here that uh, is a, you know, shows you a simple example of how to use these APIs in order to get hold of state and do calls. So this is a node application I have here. It's a very simple node app. Um, and it just has a couple of endpoints here, order and uh, new order. And you'll see here that the order allows me to receive an order and it saves uh, saves that order uh, and it retrieves the order that I get sent from me. So here I have 
is I have this uh, state URL here. I can just call on to this particular store name here with state, and I can get back the particular order. Um, and equally, the new order method here will call, uh, will create a key value store of my choice, and it will save it to the state store here, which is this way of describing my state store here. So how do I plug in my state store here? You define these components. Um, and in this particular case, state store name here um, is a, a Redis component here called state store. So this is just saving it in a local Redis state store. And I can plug this in and change this. So if you want to get going with Dapper, um, Dapper has a very simple CLI. You can do Dapper init like this, and Dapper init um, gets uh, um, sets up your local development environment for you to be able to get going. Uh, and that includes, for example, um, deploying Dapper onto your machine and configuring things like a local state store here, which is a local Redis state store that I can just use for testing out, saving some state data to. And then this Dapper CLI um, is fairly comprehensive. This Dapper CLI that, um, that you can use um, takes advantage of being able to run your application or post or get list instances of where it's running or take advantage of various different types of um, commands that you can do. So instead of just running this application um, with, uh, you know, as I would normally would with a Python or a, a node command, I can actually trigger this application and take advantage of the dapper run command. So what the dapper run command does is it says launch my Python application uh, with a particular ID um, and, uh, and launch uh, this particular Python app. Now, I haven't showed you the Python app just yet here. This is a node app. I have this Python app here as well. Um, and what the Python app is doing is it's, it's calling onto that uh, method, new order endpoint I showed you in the node application, calling the invoke method. It's just creating a, a key value pair here state and, and calling onto that and doing a service invocation. So here's this Dapper URL. It's calling onto this and saying, here's my, here's my order that I'm sending you. So in this world here, I have my Python application. I'm going to spin up and I'm going to spin up my node application and you'll see them sending messages between each other. So let's uh, spin up the node application here. As I spin up this node application here, um, I will also open up another terminal. Here, we open up another terminal. Um, let me just grab a little command here at the moment. So I can save me typing and I'll spin up my, my Python application. And there it is, my Python application is spun up and it's starting to generate and send orders into my node application. So if I spin back here, you'll see that my node application now is receiving these uh, requests here. It's calling onto the invoke method. These are you know, running my local machine, but this can be in very in any environment. Um, and as it calls onto this new order method, it takes the data that I get out of the request and puts it into my Redis store. So you can see here, I've got my Redis Explorer. If I look down here, you'll see that I've got order seven, order eight, um, as I go and persist this data locally. So this is a super simple way just to show I have now created a long running stateful node application using Dapper to store key value pairs of my data. And you can store any amount of data in there that you've, um, you know, is useful for your application. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop this at the moment because I've decided, well, you know, I, I didn't really want to store this into Redis. Um, I wish I'd actually stored it into Cosmos DB. Um, so rather than having to rewrite my code now to pull in Cosmos DB libraries, I can simply say, well, I'm not going to use um, the Redis component anymore. I'm going to switch out here. And I'm actually going to just rename state store that I had before to be a Cosmos DB state store now with all the metadata that I need to connect to it. And all, by the way, all of this can be hidden in a key value, uh, a key, uh, Azure Key Vault to pull down the, the, uh, the uh, secrets information without it being inlined inside here. So now I kind of say, well, I, I still have this Python application running, but I'm going to actually now restart my node application. And this time, when it loads up, it's going to hook up instead to um, an, a Cosmos DB store. And now it's starting to receive orders, but they're no longer going to this, um, they're no longer going here to my uh, Redis store. Instead, I'll switch out here and I'll go and look at um, my portal here. I'll open up my Cosmos DB store here um, that I'm posting these things to. If I go and look at the Data Explorer and load up the Data Explorer, I have this. Uh, a database here called orders. And if I look at the items inside here, you'll see now 
that here, here's, I'm starting to see my orders coming inside here. If I refresh this, is it order 34 or order 35? So now by simply switching out the component that gets used, the orders now are being, instead of saved to a Redis local store, they're being saved to a Cosmos DB store without doing any code changes myself. Um, and this it reflects the power effectively of what Dapper provides. You know, you as a developer now can take advantage of these capabilities um, without having to understand and switch out uh, and understand all the different types of um, stores or pub sub mechanisms that you want to save this to. And this component model um, is one of the key things that allows Dapper to become very flexible um, and integrated into any one of your applications, um, as well as being able to take advantage of the sort of very simple um, way of to crafting up a URL um, and being able to use that to save data. So that was a good little demo there. Um, I'll pause at this point. Are there any questions that we should take? Um, so we haven't had any in, in the, the, the channel, um, although there's, there's quite a nice little back chat going beside between my, myself and, and Alex, Mark. So you, you mentioned some pretty interesting stuff in there about sort of service discovery, right? So you've, you've got um, your different components that can talk to each other in a relatively straightforward way. Um, is that service discovery entirely within the application or is there capability or, or even a desire on the part of the team to expand that service discoverability to, if you like, between applications? So um, I might have a completely different app, maybe not even written within that Dapper framework that could call and, that could call and discover services that are part of my other Dapper apps using the same mechanisms. Yes, yeah. So the answer to that is that the service discovery mechanism actually takes advantage of the platform. So here we're using it for local service discovery. Uh, but when it gets deployed into other environments like Kubernetes, it takes advantage of the DNS resolution inside there. And inside there, you know, I may have app in one namespace and an app in a different namespace that I can call between any one of those applications that allows me to do that service discovery. Um, you are actually also allowed to isolate them by using those namespaces and prevent that. Um, so you can both use it to your advantage of um, taking advantage of the platform, such as Kubernetes, to kind of hi hide your application so they can't do discovery. But at the same time, yes, you can discover any application that's running inside there through the discovery mechanism. So, yes, that's entirely possible. Okay. That sounds really interesting. Mark, you will keep monitoring what's going on and, and okay. throw more questions at you later. Perfect. So now you've sort of got the idea, um, you can go down and go crazy on all this. So publish and subscribe. It's a very, very common thing to be able to say, I want to build an event-driven system where I want to be able to publish messages that other people should subscribe to, you know, such as, you know, this uh, particular price change inside my application or, you know, this particular uh, event happened in this workflow, go off and do some processing inside it all. So Dapper has a built-in pub sub me mechanism where you can take advantage of a number of different pub sub servers, you know, like Redis or Nats or Service Bus or GCP pub sub here. And then I can have, in this case, an email and shipping service that have subscribed to the topic order. And when they do, they get sent uh, the data packet, um, you know, broad, you know, broadcast to all of those who subscribed to the pub sub mechanism. So this is very powerful. It allows you to take advantage of you know, a number of different pub sub different types of servers or um, and build pub sub mechanisms so you can do adventurism applications. Le likewise, you know, a very common thing as well is that you have um, triggers from external um, systems such as a Kafka queue or um, a you know, event hub sending you messages. And Dapper can sit there and using the component model, listen on particular external bindings and um, external systems and then trigger your code in this case i can have an endpoint called trigger um, which i configure with dapper and dapper says you know what's the thing that you want to trigger when events come from these inputs um, so i can trigger my particular piece of code and you can do the converse as well your application can decide um, that it wants to trigger and send messages out uh, to external systems so if i wanted to send it something to my connection with some data i can decide whether that connection is a DynamoDB database or an event hub or a Twilio um, message that I want to send on SMS. Um, and you know, the, the configuration of the, uh, the components inside here allow you to change how the message gets sent out. So this event-driven mechanism allows you to have 
you're co-triggered, whether um, you can have messages coming externally or internally or between the actual applications themselves. And while all of this happens, um, Dapper is sort of monitoring and taking care of your application through observability, metrics, and logs. Um, we take advantage of open census right now as the format, um, and you can push all that data into a variety of different uh, observability stores, such as Zipkin and Azure Insights, uh, App Insights, um, or Jaeger. Um, and this is also, I think, is a key piece of this because you know, a lot of the time developers are having to figure out how do they do diagnostics inside my application. Dapper takes care of that all for you. Um, and you will soon be moving, in fact, in the next release and afterwards to open telemetry, which is the um, now the standard format that has been uh, uh, represented inside CNCF uh, for the uh, data on the wire that can be pushed into these uh, observability stores. So let me show you a little example of what the diagnostics and tracing looks like. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull up um, the full Dapper samples repo. And at the same time, I'm going to show you um, what it's like to deploy um, Dapper into uh, other in, uh, your application into other environments that Dapper uses. So I have my same application I had here before. You know, this is the node application, which is sort of saving my state. Um, but this time, I actually took this application and rather than running it locally, I deployed it into a Kubernetes cluster. And all you have to do in that world of things is that here's my Kubernetes deployment specification for that application. I built that application into a, a containerized image. And as part of the deployment, in the same way that I showed you the CLR, I indicate here that this particular application, when it gets deployed, wants Dapper as a sidecar enabled on it. Uh, here's a particular name of the uh, app I want to give it, and here's a port that I want to open. So this is sort of like the CLR equivalent in a deployment to the Kubernetes world, launching this particular image that I built here. I can do the same with my Python application here as well. And in this particular case, um, what I've actually also got and done is that we have this other uh, uh, application here, which is a, a calculator application, um, which is a fun little distributed application where each one of the operations of the calculator um, is built by its own individual service. So the adder service is done written in Go, uh, the divide service is written in Node, and the, uh, the multiplier is in Python, and the subtract is inside .NET. So those have also been deployed. So if I go and look at my cluster here, um, you'll see um, now that actually, this is my Kubernetes cluster. You'll see that here's my Python and my Node application I've just got deployed and running inside here. Um, and here's some of the other pods that have been deployed for this application. I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but these are the integration of the uh, services that we have for Dapper in order to make sure that Dapper understands this Kubernetes environment. Um, to get this going on your Kubernetes environment, you simply do uh, Dapper init-k, and that installs Dapper onto your Kubernetes environment that gets you up and going. And now um, I can actually sort of take advantage of seeing these applications run. So in this particular case, this uh, calculator application is running, um, and you'll see uh, it's uh, here. This is this calculator application. So I can do a bunch of operations inside here on this calculator application, and each one of these um, is each one of these is uh, is pushing and calling onto one of those uh, from the front end React application onto those back end services inside here. So, in order to, to visualize this all, I want to take advantage of seeing some diagnostics. Um, so, what I can do is I can turn on a diagnostics tracing tool. I think I've still got this thing running here. I, I launched Zipkin here um, earlier inside my cluster. Uh, and now, both that Python application that we saw earlier, you know, calling and pushing the orders plus this calculator application, I can visualize all the data that's happening inside here. I can see all the call graphs, um, and I can see all the trace log inf information inside this all. Um, and I can build exactly the same view as this inside App Insights uh, to take advantage of the app map, uh, which is another place, and we'll have uh, you know, many other more observability tools like this. Um, so for example, I can dive down into this Python application. I can search for the traces here. Um, and then I can look at one of these particular traces 
And I can see the call graph here. So you can see the invoke here called onto my node app uh, new order method here. Uh, the total time it took was 5.68 milliseconds calling the way through, which includes um, all the way through in terms of saving that state. Um, takes a little bit longer here because it's just saving out to Cosmos DB. You'll find that if I actually switch this out for Reddit, this goes down to about two or three milliseconds. Um, so the store time here, you see inside this node app here, um, this time it takes to save the state to the Cosmos DB app is the one that kind of is dominating the whole call graph. So this lovely visualization of your data gets given to you for free. Um, Plus Dapper as well has built in um, dashboards. Um, this is actually the dashboard for you to be able to see the state of your system services that are running inside your Kubernetes cluster, um, the overall numbers of services created, uh, the number of services deleted inside here, uh, the number of sidecars that get generated, um, and also every service itself gets uh, a certificate deployed to it all because you have secure end-to-end -end security between your services. And you can see the certificate creation um, and signing a request deployed to each one of the Dapper sidecars inside here. So this visualization of what's happening inside your dashboard, um, and we have a similar one like this for your services, provides you a detailed view, uh, as well as actually as a fun little console that we bought here, to, um, built here to see just sort of the state of your running applications if you want a little dashboard that we put inside here. So this is all about visualization, um, seeing that data, um, and making sure that you're able to, uh, you know, di diagnose, particularly at um, deployment time and in production, um, you know, the metrics of how long a call takes, seeing the call graphs and putting out the logs inside here. Finally, uh, I think one of the most exciting building blocks that we have as part of this uh, got contributed by the community, and that is how you can get hold of secrets. Um, I don't know how you know, you've tried to kind of pull out a particular secret that you wanted to use inside your application because you wanted to be able to attach to a backend SQL database and how it relates credentials. And you know that you should be storing that inside a, uh, a secure vault rather than putting it in your code or having to build it as part of your CI CD system. Um, Dapper provides, does all the hard work of being able to authenticate on the behalf of your code to external secret stores, pull down secrets, and give them back to you through a local API call that you can call to a particular my vault that gets configured to any number of these different secret stores. So you see that you know, we built in Azure Key Vault when we released, um, but since then, yeah, you can do it for HashiCorp Vault, AWS Secrets, Google uh, Secrets Manager, and store all your secrets, including also storing secrets inside the environment itself if you want to store them inside uh, the Kubernetes secret store as well. So this way of getting hold of secrets um, we've seen numerous times people just have to build a whole bunch of code themselves to do this all. Um, and in the Azure world, this actually will also take care of um, the uh, pod identity as well if you're running inside a Kubernetes environment. Talking of what the Kubernetes environment looks like, um, you know, Dapper will target multiple different environments. Um, Kubernetes, Service Fabric, Docker Swarm as, as part of them. Um, for now, we've started off on you know, self-hosted on your local machine or running inside sort of VMs and targeting sort of Kubernetes. Um, and so here, as I showed you earlier, you know, these system services um, take care of when you spin up your application code itself, the sidecar injector injects a sidecar on your behalf. The Sentry service is a super um, key service because it does it's a certificate authority and it provides a certificate generation and uh, upgrade across all of the um, applications uh, that you have running inside or services you have running inside your environment. So you can do end-to-end -end security through MTLS all the way through between you know, can app, a service one calling onto service two uh, inside your deployment. So this, you know, the, the difficulty of in securing your code um, is taken care of for you by the Sentry service. Uh, and then the operator takes care of updating and pulling in the various components to uh, make sure your Dapper sidecar um, is aware of them as they get changed. Um, I showed you how it looks inside a Kubernetes environment um, and what it looks like. Um, you know, in fact, if I just return back to that here, yeah, these are yeah, the Kubernetes operators running inside here uh, as that first class experience. But the point here is that 
you know, this is just a way to make sure that you can take advantage of Dapper running in that particular environment and certainly other environments such as IoT Edge um, and Service Fabric and these other ones are also sort of part of the roadmap as we go down. Um, so this, but, but, you know, Kubernetes is one that's sort of fairly universal, so it's a, a, you know, an easy one to target to begin with. And you get them to deploy inside here. In fact, if you just do, um, if you look at the services running inside here, uh, if you look at the services, you'll see that for each one of these services that get deployed here, my node application, there's a Dapper sidecar running next to it that I can see here um, running. So that's how it gets launched and run. Mark, would you mind if I threw a couple of quick questions at you? Go for it. Uh, and as a as a quick aside, you we seem to have lost your camera, sir. If if you turn that back on at some some point, um, so a question from the the channel, which is re the relevant to what you were just talking about, in terms of calls from app to sidecar, are there plans for any kind of security to be implemented to sort of lock that down? Uh, from app to sidecar. Oh yes. Um, well, that's a bit of a debate. Uh, yes, there has been some asks where, you know, from, you know, if you look at uh, the diagram I had previously uh, from the app here to this sidecar, can this be secure? Well, this actually depends on the environment you're running in. So, you know, typically inside a Kubernetes environment, inside this pod, this is sort of the scene, a secure environment. Uh, but we have actually had requests um, to ask about, um, can this uh, be secure over here? So we're thinking about it, yes. Uh, a little, a little, it is a little bit more extreme um, because it does require that something has got into the pod um, that, or, or whatever the, the hosting environment is to be able to attack this channel here, which is a lot harder to do. But it is something that's worth considering, yes. Okay. And, and also, you were showing Visual Studio Code just a second ago, and I, I noticed that down the bottom of your um, left-hand bar is the little Dapper hat. Um, oh, yes. The Dapper extension that you've not mentioned. Oh yes, okay. Let me go. Let me here. Let me switch back here. Let me show you this. In, in uh, I let me see if I can do a demo of this one here. Uh, okay. So what you can do? Yes, there's a Dapper extension inside here. A Dapper extension allows you to launch and do debugging locally of your application. So I think I've got this one set up here. This particular one has a, a launch JSON here that allows me to go into my code. So for example, um, inside this, I've got a couple of breakpoints set here. I could actually go and do run, um, start debugging. And uh, if I do debugging here, it'll launch Dapper locally inside here. And you'll see that I've got, uh, I can hit breakpoints here with Dapper um, by using this Dapper sidecar. Um, and I can do a full debugging through my application. And what I'm able to do um, is I'm able to, if I just let this, uh, if I just let this run, yeah, this is my application application now it's up and running um, so this uh, these tasks.jsons inside here will be able to give me the deep full debugging experience I can go into this dapper sidecar here I can actually now do an invoke method inside here so I can actually sort of invoke the order method inside here and you see there I am I've done the, I've called the uh, node uh, invoke method inside here calling that order method and now I can do a step through inside this I can actually step out of that inside of here and you'll see that I'm doing a full debugging experience. So yes, there's a great little plugin inside Visual Studio Code that allows you to do a debugging experience like this um, and also take advantage of being able to do gets, posts and publishes into your application to test them out rather than doing on the CLI. So yeah, great question. And hopefully there's a little extra demo there I didn't think about. <laughs> that, was, that was great, thanks. Thanks, Mark. And um, I'll, I'll let you get back to your, to your presentation for now, but I'm, I'm, we've got some more questions that I'll throw at you at the end. Okay. Um, let's sort of go up a level a little bit and go into what, you know, the, you know, talk about you as a developer here. So the key thing is, is I showed you lots of HTTP calls, or we can do GRPC calls, and you can do them at that level. And that's like the lowest common denominator. But we've also built language specific SDKs because we recognize developers like to fit inside their particular language, whether that's Node or Go or Python or whatever. Um, and we've also integrated with a set of frameworks as well on top of that, things like ASP.NET Core and Spring Boot. Um, and coming on the roadmap soon, uh, hopefully next month, is integration with Logic Apps and Functions. So effectively, you get this layering. You've got Dapper and its building blocks. Um, 
and then through you know, they can en engage through the HTTP and gRPC APIs through a gRPC gRPC APIs we do uh, generated uh, gRPC proto generated SDKs which are generated versions from on top of the uh, building block APIs that we have. And then on top of the, some of those particular ones, we're slowly working through and create, and you could use these SDKs at this level here. So these are perfectly usable SDKs. It's just that, you know, they may not be the most beautiful of them because they're generated, um, but you can go off and use these SDKs at this level uh, as a first class language to experience. Um, however, we've crafted ones that are a little bit nicer for Java and .NET and all of the other ones are coming along soon. Um, so you have a, a, a slightly uh, better experience in terms of some of the types that get used. And then on top of that, particularly, um, we've integrated across these, in fact, uh, to provide sort of language integration at that particular level as well. So you know, we're building out application frameworks that integrate on top of these SDKs as well. Um, so you can engage at the lowest level HTTP or take advantage of these SDKs um, or up to the application frameworks themselves if that's where you feel that you're most productive. Um, so let me go and show you a couple of demos of what that looks like. Um, first, I wanted to show you, um, let's just go into an ASP.NET demo and, and show you first, uh, just ASP.NET demo, just using, without using any of the SDKs, uh, just to give you an idea of what it would look like. So here I have, is I have a, a classic, uh, simple ASP.NET app, which just got a main, um, and it's got, uh, it just creates a, a local web host running inside it all. Um, does it startup command? Um, inside my startup command, you know, here's my startup. I can do classic, you know, bring in various routing and bring in different endpoints. And the way PubSub works is that you have a subscribe endpoint that Dapper calls onto you and you say, here's the topics I'm interested in listening into. Um, and then you have endpoints inside your ASP.NET application. So here's topic A and here's topic B. And all I do is I get the body of the message out and I read it and send it back to you. Now, I can run and launch this uh, particular application. Let me just go and grab a little script here a moment. Um, I can run, run this with a dapper command. So I can do dapper run, name of my application, app ID. Uh, it's going to listen on this particular port and it's a .NET application. So here I am. I'm going to run this. Uh, and once it's up and running, there we go, it's launched. I can um, bring up another window here um, and I can take advantage of Dapper CLI in order to publish a topic. So this is, I'm gonna publish uh, a topic onto topic A, which is this topic A just here. Um, and I can do uh, things like uh, uh, global, global, global Azure is awesome. Um, and then I can publish this message here. And this just shows how you know, the simplicity of bringing in PubSub. If I now go back to where my ASP.NET app is running, you'll see you know, here I received a topic A post message from Dapper. Um, I received a message, Global Azure is awesome. Um, and here's the event received. So you know, at the simplest, I could just plug in and take advantage of um, you know, the HTTP calls like this. Uh, but I can go up the stack um, and I can take advantage instead of a first class client uh, that we've built for .NET. Um, and so here I have a very simple program and I'll combine the two in a bit. Um, here a very simple uh, console application. So it's just a main application. I mean, I can pull in a single library here, Dapper Client, which is a NuGet library that we publish um, onto NuGet. And inside Dapper Client, you can actually use Dapper Client Builder to get hold of a, a particular client. And now I can take advantage of publishing events or saving um, state uh, through a first class API. So here I am, I have my save state that takes my Dapper Client and you'll see now that instead of having me to deal with uh, HTTP methods, I can take advantage of you know, a set of um, uh, client methods inside here uh, that, sorry, that allow me to save state uh, or, um, del or sorry, save state or get state, save state or get state. Um, and now I can really do this through a first class language experience rather than through a web-like experience. 
Um, so in this particular case, I've got a widget. Um, I can actually go and run this particular application here. Um, so I'm going to run again, run docker run. Uh, here's the application. I'm going to run this one locally. I configured this to store into my local uh, Redis store. And uh, you'll see that I called the publish event, saves and get the data back out. So here I am. You'll see that yeah, I published uh, a topic here. So I think it was topic A. You'll see that this conforms to the cloud event specification. Um, the data is inside here is my, oh, that was my, uh, my global Azure event. Maybe it was just topic B. Um, oh, no, okay. The event is somewhere inside here. But as you can see here, here's my test data that I saved inside here, which is my data, which is my little widget I saved and retrieved it all. So now I can just take a, you know, a first class a language experience if I want to in order to take advantage of Dapper and pulling it in as a client library. Um, I can now sort of combine these two if I want with a local client um, API, um, which I have here, you know, this local client um, with ASP.NET. Um, and if I switch over, I'm going to give some love to Visual Studio now. Uh, this is one of our uh, you know, sample applications that we have here now, which is a, uh, an ASP.NET core application that shows a controller. And just like I showed you before, you know, it has a main function that's launching ASP.NET applications, uh, sorry, ASP.NET um, web, web, web endpoints. And inside the startup method here, just like I showed you before, um, I could take advantage of now a first class integration at the ASP.NET controller level. Um, so now, you know, as part of a configuration here, we've done a first class experience where as part of configure services, I can just add a service here called add dapper client. So that pulls it in and gives me, you know, by a, uh, by injection, gives me a client class um, that I can use a dapper client class. Um, and now I'm also able to take a look at my routing endpoints here. Um, and inside my routing endpoints here, rather than having to have the publish and subscribe endpoints built inside my application, I can have an ASP.NET experience here where I can say with topic here, and then this is a pub sub message that comes into me that I can uh, retreat, uh, get activate my code set instead. So I can now bring in publish, you know, have my ASP.NET application be invoked with, you know, it's, if I bring a broader superpower to ASP.NET because now I can have publish and subscribe events triggering my endpoints here, my uh, ASP.NET endpoints. And then this particular endpoint here, deposit, is an endpoint that's down here. And then inside here, I can take advantage of the client class that I'm here using here to save the state into a particular store. So here I'm combining both the client class that I've got here with a, uh, the routing for PubSub and putting it all together into an ASP.NET experience. Um, where I can take advantage of these publishing events. Um, and inside a, a controller example, if you look at the controller syntax inside here, you add attributes instead inside the controller for the deposit. Um, so this gives you very productive now capabilities that you never had before, state long running stateful ASP node applications, ones that can be triggered with events, um, ones that can have, uh, can retrieve secrets and everything else is the power of Dapper brought to you. Um, good. So let me uh, switch back to my slides. Uh, and I think I'm on the home run, actually, just here now. I showed you that SDK client. I showed you the SDKs. Um, I'm going to finish up just talking a little bit about actors, um, and then we'll open up for some questions. I, I really don't quite have time to show you an actor demo. Um, but you know, also, as a first-class experience, if you're familiar with the uh, actors that were built into service fabric as a concept which allow you to hold state and compute together into a single entity you can create millions of these things inside the, your environment um, they are turn-based um, and they have state associated with them and generally you know in your environment you can have lots of these things running if they fail uh, so dapper takes care of rehosting them into other environments um, and these are uh, Another 
a powerful way for you to build your applications, particularly if you're doing things like IoT systems with virtual devices or gaming systems, for example. Um, and they're very, very similar to service network reliable access if you use them all. Um, that's what I've had. I've got time for some questions, but you know, I you know we're thrilled that the community has just sort of dived in and really helped us uh, with so many of external contributors, many of them MVPs, many of them that we recognize who've helped us um, over the last few months. Um, the repo um, is you know, getting close at 6,000 uh, stars. Um, if you love this presentation, please go and star the repo because that's something that yeah, it's actually we're actively watching. Um, and we have a community call that happens every two weeks. Uh, we're very open. We do fun demos. Uh, we dive onto that every week. We bring out some demos to show. We have one coming up next Tuesday. Uh, you can join it by going to Dapper Community and um, and coming to ask us anything. We are open to any question in any way. That's me. Mark, that was great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. I'll just remind you again, if it's possible for you to turn your camera on and then we, we can chat, that would be great. Um, so that, that, was a, that was a really interesting session. DAP has been around for a while now and it, it's, it's, um, now and it, it's, it's um, engagement's been, been really great. It's been pretty meteoric. I was looking at the GitHub repo. You're at version 0.6. Um, a question from the channel and I know this comes up a lot with, with, with customers who are looking to adopt technology and try and decide which ones to pick. When do you think you're going to hit 1.0? Oh, great question. Um, so that's the primary goal of where we're going at this moment in time. So this is where we are working very, very closely with about uh, between five and 10 uh, customers at the moment and taking that DAP into production. And what that means is that we are getting it into real world uh, deployments, running at scale. Uh, they're you know, hardening and testing it all. And so our goal is in the second half of this year is to get it to a stable 1.0 version. That's so that's the roadmap. So you'll see at the moment that we're doing lots of things about end-to-end -end testing, perf testing, scale testing. Um, we're doing lots of resilience testing. Uh, we have external security orders coming along. Um, so. That's, tab that's where we are taking the direction of the application. Great question. Is my camera working now, by the way? Yes, it is. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs> uh, so related to that then, have, have you seen much engagement from, from um, sort of larger organizations who are starting to develop their applications using DAPA? We have actually, yes. In fact, we have several internal projects that are happening and using DAPA. And we have about, about coming up to about 10 external companies who are actually taking DAPA into production. Um, they range from things like building intelligent buildings, um, IoT devices, to a financial transaction application, to telcos uh, integration for building sort of a workflow telco application, line of business applications. Um, and then on a range of uh, Node, Java, Go, and .NET, all being the strong languages that they're using inside there. Um, and in fact, we're looking for more. So if you have a project that you'd like to collaborate with us on, um, we are more than happy to help dive in, do design reviews, uh, because we recognize that that's what we're doing. Okay, that's that sounds great. Hopefully our, our viewers will will try and get in touch with you over, over that one. How should they get in touch if they think they have a, an appropriate project? Uh, well, send me an email. Um, my email, you can directly send me an email to, um, it's on my slide here right at the very beginning. You can send me an email to um, mfussel.microsoft.com. But you can also dive in on our Gitter channel here. So we have a Gitter channel that you can go and ask questions on. Um, and feel free to just throw a question on here and on this Gitter channel here. Yeah, this is very an active community at the moment where we have people who come and ask questions. So this is another place. Either of those will work. OK. Um all the way through your demos there, Mark, you, you're obviously uh, using containers. The, the Dapper command line was all Kubernetes. How tightly is Dapper tied to Kubernetes? Do I, do I have to use that as my container orchestrator? Do I even have to use containers at all? So a good question. And the answer is yeah, all of the CLI commands I shot were not bound locally to containers <laughs> or Kubernetes. So my local experience 
is actually when I deploy it locally, I, I can run Dapper as a, just simply as a sidecar process. Um, it's not bound to containers. And there are a couple of uh, we require just contain a uh, Docker on your local machine because we happen to deploy Redis there as a simple container for your local development environment. But locally, it all runs as processes. And I want to sort of stress as well that Dapper is not tied to Kubernetes in any way. It's entirely host independent. It can run on other platforms as well. In fact, we're targeting IoT Edge, um, Azure Stack Edge. Uh, you can run it on VMs um, and Service Fabric as well. It will be on that roadmap as well on those PAMs. So yeah, it's very important to realize that the code that you take is portable across different platforms. It just requires some level of integration. So for example, the service invocation requires integration to the host platform but the pub stuff doesn't. So you can just run that anywhere. So you know, there's some levels of integration that you need to have. But yes, Dapper is not bound to Kubernetes.